In this video, I'm installing a DC to DC charger in my friend's van. He got a 12 volt starter battery and a 24 volt DIY lithium battery. I installed a few years ago. That's why we're using the 12, 24, 15 amp version. We need a DC to DC charger because lithium batteries can accept a lot of current very quickly. Without a charger, the large lithium battery would try to pull too much current from the alternator, which will overload it and eventually burn it out. Lead acid batteries have a higher internal resistance, so they naturally limit the current. But lithium batteries don't. That's why we're using this device. I've chosen the non-isolated model because it's less expensive, about $28. And both batteries share the same ground anyway. Let's take a closer look at the device itself. Up here are the input terminals from your starter battery. The maximum wire size these input terminals accept is 6 gauge or 16 mm square. Remember, you're actually drawing power from the alternator through the starter battery. You're not draining the starter battery itself, so we won't shorten the battery's life. On the other side are the output terminals to the house battery. There's also a small port for connecting a remote on-off switch. I'm using a simple toggle switch. When the engine is running and I flip this switch, the charger will start charging the household battery. The device also has engine running detection, so it stops charging when the engine turns off or the voltage drops below a set voltage. Later in the video, we'll talk about why this model is non-isolated and what that means. But for now, just note that it has three main outputs instead of four. If you decide to buy this DC to DC charger, make sure you get the TR Smart version and not the DC to DC converter, because that's just a voltage converter and not a charger. Now let's talk about wiring and fuse sizes, often the most confusing part. We need to fuse every positive cable, one on the input and one on the output. I prefer to size cables and fuses myself, rather than following Victron's generic table, which tends to be too large. If you're not comfortable with sizing your own wires and fuses, just follow Victron's recommendations. For the input side, we're dealing with 12 volts and 2 meter single way wire run, or 6.5 feet. I've chosen an 8 gauge or 10 millimeter square cable, just like Victron does. An 8 gauge cable with 90 degrees Celsius insulation can handle about 55 amps. Victron suggests using a 60 amp fuse. But I'm quite confused as to why they would suggest this. Because this cable can only carry 55 amps. Let's calculate it ourselves. The charger is rated at 15 amps output at 24 volts for a total of 360 watts. The efficiency of the DC to DC charger is 88%, so the input power must be greater and that's 410 watts. At 12 volts, this gives us a current on the input side of 34 amps. Then we apply a safety factor of 1.25 and we get 42.6 amps. And that's why I'm using a 50 amp MIDI fuse, not the 60 amp fuse Victron recommends. If you're using a 60 amp fuse, you need to increase your wire diameter to 6 gauge or 16 mm square. MIDI fuses are rated for lower currents, so in this case, MIDI fuses are perfect. You can also use an MRBF fuse on the mains battery positive, 
which I'm using in the demo. On the output side, we have 24 volts and a cable run of 5 meters or 16.5 feet. Victron's table suggests using an 8 gauge or 10 millimeter square. I did a voltage drop calculation and decided to use 10 gauge or 6 millimeter square. At 24 volts and 15 amps over 5 meters, the voltage drop is about 0.5 volts or 2.1%. Now we need a fuse that protects the cable but still supports the maximum current. A 10 gauge cable is rated for 40 amps and the max output is 15 amps times a safety factor of 1.25 equals 18.75. So a fuse size between these values is 30 amps. I'm using a 30 amp MIDI fuse. Once the wiring is complete, connect the starter battery to the charger first, because we have to program our household battery. Open the Victron Connect app on your phone and pair with the charger. The first thing you should do is update the firmware. Then set the function from power supply to charger. Check that the battery type is set to lithium iron phosphate and adjust the settings if needed. Then we have a setting called engine shutdown detection. This detects if your alternator is running. If enabled, it turns off the charger if it's not running. Sometimes you have to decrease the start voltage to 13.5 volts because some alternators don't go over 13.5 volts or the voltage drop is too high. The input voltage lockout setting is like a low voltage disconnect for your starter battery. You can use the default settings so that the charger can't drain the starter battery when the engine isn't running. I'm using a combination of a manual switch and the input voltage lockout. I don't use engine detection for now. The app doesn't offer current limiting, so you can't throttle the charging current. It's fixed at the model's rated output. However, when it gets too hot, it will reduce the current by itself. It's handy that the app tells you why the device is not charging. This can be because of the switch is not triggered or the input voltage is too low. You cannot turn the charger on and off in the app. I think that would have been useful, so I didn't have to wire the external switch. For this demo setup, I have connected a 12 volt lithium iron phosphate instead of a lead acid battery because I didn't have one laying around. And then I wired two 12 volt batteries in series. Now I don't recommend this, but it's only for a demo setup. Then I have a 50 amp fuse going into the DC to DC charger and on the output I have a 30 amp MIDI fuse. Both batteries share the common negative and they collect on this point here. This cable is 10 millimeter square so that's the biggest in this system because this is also 10 millimeter square. I decided to not connect the negative to the chassis of the vehicle because I don't want the current to run through the van's metal body. I don't recommend using your chassis as a return pot. That's why I use this terminal post as a common ground. So let's test the functioning of the system. When I flip this switch and the voltage of the battery is high enough, then it will start charging the household battery. We can see it's starting charging at 35 amps and on the output we have 15.7 amps. And when I forget to turn off the switch when the engine has stopped, I set the lockout voltage to 12.5 volts. And if it reaches the 12.5 volt, 
the charger will stop. This safety feature prevents you from draining the starter battery if you forget to turn off the switch. The charger has now been installed. Let's take a look at the starter battery. Here you can see the starter battery. Now the alternator is putting in 11.3 amps and the voltage of the battery is 11.18 volts. We're not charging yet because the remote input is inactive. When I press this switch, the charging will start. And we will see the current starting to increase. This is the current from the alternator. So let's see how much current is going to the DC to DC charger. 33 amps. So this is the negative cable to the charger and this is the positive cable to the charger. It goes in this cable channel under the seat to the fuse and then it goes into the charger right there let's now go to the back of the van to see where it ends up this cable comes from the charger and then it goes into the 30 amp fuse and then into the bus bar same with the negative it goes straight to the bus bar the charger is putting in 15 amps into the battery and we're still on the bulk charge. Uh, let's take a look at the battery. This is a DIY battery, uh, 24 volts with uh, 280 amp hour LFK uh, batteries. These were still about $100 a cell but nowadays you can find them at $55 per cell. This was built two or three years ago with the JK BMS. We also have a Phoenix 24 volt 500 VA inverter, a converter which converts the 24 volts to 12 volts for lighting circuits. The fridge is on 24 volts and we have also a blue smart charger 24 volts 13 amps and the shunt we have mounted here this one costs 215 dollars at the moment they also have more efficient models like the orion xs the 12 volt version comes in at 300 dollars and a 24 volt version $356. We didn't choose for these because it's too much current for the alternator and it costs $140 more. I hope you learned something new in this video. If you did, give it a like and feel free to ask questions in the comments. I will link all the components and the manual in the description. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one.